Good evening. I trust you had a great day this Wednesday, the day that concludes our special coverage on anti-poaching. It does not mean that we will not talk about it anymore. It means this war continues nationally. KTN will keep this war alive for as long as the poacher is killing our elephants. So we say, keep off our elephants. And we'll continue to say it. Kenya lost 74 elephants to poaching in only three months this year. That is between January and March. And that is how serious this war is. Welcome to KTN Prime. I'm James Smart. Rita Tinina is still at the Nairobi National Park. And she will be telling us so much tonight. Rita, what do you have for us? Well, James, tonight I will be telling you something about Ahmed. Ahmed the elephant that is arguably Kenya's most famous elephant and an iconic symbol in the decades old fight against poaching. We shall also be speaking to the KWS spokesman Paul Mbugwa on matters conservation. James. Thank you very much, Rita. We will be coming back to you shortly. First, the highlights. NHIF Hospital Project, government now say no to 7.2 billion shilling consultancy fees. There is a possibility of uh, a solution coming from engagement. As government, we will want to really not engage, we don't want to engage on, on the politicking. We want to give service to the people. URP struggles to contain Isaac Ruto of a referendum push. Wewe nyumbani uko na title 4, uko na title 5. Tano zako kwa jina lako, tano kwa kampuni zako. The politics of Uhuru's offer of land title deeds to coast residents. And the story of the only elephant that was guarded 24 hours a day. Good evening and welcome to Kitten Prime. I'm James Smart. President Uru Kenyatta will from Friday issue 60,000 land titles to residents in six counties at the coast. The exercise is, however, being viewed as a move to consolidate support in an area where the Jubilee government performed poorly in the last general election. And at least 300 families in Kisauni have threatened to sue the government if they are not issued with the titles. Catherine Omwantho has that report. Joseph Carissa puts his house in order. These papers and land records may come in handy very soon. He hopes his name is included among the 60,000 title deeds promised to men and women just like him. Men and women who have land that they have lived on, farmed on, but have nothing to show for it. This safari ya kwanzia kutafuta haki yetu ya mambo ya ya title imianza 19 95 wakati tulipoambiwa kwamba ni lazima tuwe tunalipa mambo ya ya ground rates na kidibitisho ni zoezi risiti hizi hapa Joseph along with 300 other families are considered squatters after a land lease from Ngongeni in Kisauni expired in 2007 while he's hopeful that he will be a beneficiary, there are those who are not taking any chances. I tell the coast people to take them and then if they will be wrong, we can sue the government of Kenya through the fake documents they have given. Residents of Mgongeni are anxious to see the fulfillment of one of President Uhuru Kenyatta's promises, oblivious of the political bickering surrounding the 60,000 title deeds. Not only do we not know who the beneficiaries are, we do not even know where these places or, or the people who are meant to be getting these title deeds are living right now. It is unfortunate that elected leaders have chosen to work in complete discordance with the normal monarch.
As of Wednesday evening, all coast leaders from both sides of the political divide had agreed to have title deeds issued from this Friday. This comes after a day-long meeting with the Cabinet Secretary for Lands, Charity Ngilu. Ngilu apparently clarified to court leaders how and why they settled on the 60,000 landowners. Catherine Omwando, KTN. The PQ, in association with Nguvu Cement. Um, so that's what leads us to a big question tonight and we ask, do you support the government's offer of 60,000 title deeds to coast residents? San Mio Yes or No answers to the number 8040. You can tweet me at James Smart and I'll sample your views during this live newscast and give you that poll result at the end of this live newscast. Choose Nguvu for undoubted strength. All right now, the emotive land question that dominated political campaigns in the coastal region is now back on the discussion table months into the new Jubilee administration. President Uru Kenyatta's move to issue 60,000 title deeds has been termed a ploy to hoodwink coastal residents. KTN's Ashamwilu now with an analysis of the politics of land at the coast region. 60,000 title deeds were airlifted to Mombasa Shortly after, they were loaded into this government vehicle with 60,000 coastal residents set to receive the titles from the president. However, this could be a dream shared by a much larger population that has for decades been seeking a solution to the emotive land question, not only in the coast region, but Kenya at large. What has been the process that informs these 60,000 titles? Chance is, these are all the titles on settlement schemes which are littered all over the coast. This move by the government has resurrected the skeletons of land politics in the coastal region entrenched deep in Kenya's history. Issuing title deeds to squatters was a tactical step inherited by every regime since independence. Mariamu Baki Mohamed. Former President Mwai Kibaki also dished out 30,148 title deeds to coastal residents in 2006. But the land question was never solved. It's against this tainted backdrop that land experts are now faulting President Kenyatta's decision to release the 60,000 title deeds. Are we seeing a situation where the president has been brought back to deal with land as in the past, where he will make a stop wherever he chooses, dishes out titles in some cases. The government has been faulted for overstepping its mandate and encroaching on the roles of the National Land Commission on matters land. The law requires the National Land Commission to handle public land management on behalf of national and county governments, recommend a national land policy, and to advise the government on title registration countrywide. But perhaps the clause that is causing ripples within political circles is Article 67 that requires the Commission to investigate into present or historical land injustices and recommend appropriate redress. President Uhuru Kenyatta's regime is now tasked with proving whether it is genuine in solving historical land injustices at the coast or if it's dancing the same tune played out by his predecessors. Ashamwilu, KTN, Nairobi. Well, away from land politics and the row pitting the government and contractors of the proposed Karen National Hospital may derail its construction, Cabinet Secretary for Health James Masharia has blocked the payment of a colossal amount of money as consultancy fees. Ajma Ismail has that report. It appears that the construction of the multi-billion shilling medical center in Karen will not take off any time soon. Eleven years down the line, a row between Treasury and the Ministry of Health is still derailing the proposed hospital intended to be a flagship project of Vision 2030. 
The saga now takes a new twist. Cabinet Secretary on Health James Macharia has directed the management of the NHIF not to make any further payments to purported service providers, including consultants on the proposed project. So far, the NHIF has paid out more than 1.5 billion shillings to consultants and engineers. The government is still required to fork out an additional 7.2 billion shillings. The Cabinet Secretary further directed the NHIF management and all parastatals under his ministry to give detailed information on all projects with a value that exceeds 10 million shillings. The proposed Karen Hospital is reported to have an initial budget of 4 billion shillings, which mysteriously shot to 22 billion. After completion, it will have a medical center, a training institute, and an administration building. It will also have 10 x-ray rooms, 12 high dependency unit beds, dialysis center, 26 ICU beds, and 815 beds for inpatient wards. Najma Ismail, KTN Prime. All right. Governors have now softened their stand on the referendum crusade, saying they are willing to negotiate with the government on resolving outstanding issues. Re Renegade Governor Council Chairman Isaac Ruto says a referendum would be a last resort as governors embark on talks with the government. KTN's Samogina with the details. <laughs> Devolution of power to the 47 counties has been one of the biggest gains of Kenya's three-year-old constitution. Kenyans will see at least 210 billion shillings disbursed to the counties for various functions. However, tribalism is threatening the very essence of devolution. There have been claims of majority communities in particular counties being favored in accessing employment opportunities in the counties, hence putting national cohesion at risk. The primary unit of governance in the counties is the County Executive Committee. Appointments to these many cabinets in the counties have been alleged to lack ethnic balance in many counties. We have a lot of such complaints coming in, which is why then we've resorted to moving in, because we've had all these behind the scenes um, meetings um, with, with, uh, with, with people in leadership. This has prompted the National Cohesion and Integration Commission to step in. The Mzalendo Kibunja-led NCIC is in the process of instituting guidelines to help the county governments ensure ethnic balance in the appointments. The problem is most of the counties have already approved the names of county executive committee members. This is the composition of the Kisumu County Executive Committee, for instance. At a glance, the 10-member team does not seem to represent a national outlook of any sort in a relatively cosmopolitan county. So how will the Cohesion Commission instill ethnic balance as demanded by the law? There is goodwill, but then also, as I'd spoken about the constitution, the constitution is very clear in terms of, of representation. So uh, before we wield the, the stick, you wield the carrot first. In Bomet County, whose governor Isaac Ruto is chairperson of the governor's council, this is the outlook of the county executive committee. Sources have claimed that one community has been favored in those appointments. The problem seems to exist in most of the counties, begging the question, what happens to minority communities in the counties? We must have everybody represented at the county level, that uh, when um, people look at the county government, they, anyone living in the county has to see themselves, that the county government is not a government of uh, the majority community in that county. As the Cohesion Commission team embarks on what looks like a Herculean task, the bulk of the responsibility rests on the shoulders of the county governments to ensure the constitution has devolved power and not tribalism. Ben Kitili, KTN. Well, surely that is Ben Kitili talking about devolution problems and devolving corruption. But now to the story that I read for you. And governors have now softened their stand on the referendum crusade, saying they're willing to negotiate with the government on resolving outstanding issues. Renegade Governor Council Chairman Isaac Ruto says a referendum would be a last resort as the governors embark on talks with the government. What is a meeting with the presidential political advisor seems to have softened the frosty relations between government and governors, and more so convincing the rebellious chairman of the governor's council to drop his grandstanding and invite the executive for talks, saying a referendum on the county sharing of revenue with the national government should be a last resort. There is a possibility of uh, a solution coming from engagement 
with the national government and the others, we had started developing doubts as to whether the commitment was there. But as I'm saying now is that uh, personal, I think uh, we can have an engagement to see whether we can resolve these issues. If we can be given time to engage, we might end up avoiding referendum. But blowing hot and cold, the Bomet governor would later denounce his own statement, saying a comprehensive and conclusive decision will be made after the governor's council meeting. It is our constitutional mandate to be the guardians of devolution and we jealously protect the rights of Kenyans to enjoy the fruits of our develop of our new devolved systems of governance or government without undue harassment from many sectors of the society. Meanwhile, the URP party has been annoyed by Ruto's blasting of government on the referendum push. The party retreats to Naivasha for three days. Among its agenda is to clip the Bomet governor's wings. URP plots to get to Ruto's nerve by subjecting 10 of Bomet's nominated county representatives to punitive action for skipping the party's meeting where URP resolved against the referendum. Insiders say the Naivasha meeting is just the first step into taming Isaac Ruto's rebellion and his proxies. Nonetheless, the Bomet governor seized fire on his verbal engagement with his party boss and Deputy President William Ruto on the referendum crusade. Ruto says the statement was hurting their supporters. Kuna wito kutoka kwa watu kadha, wafuasi wetu, pamoja na watu kadha, wanaulize kwa nini musionge. In the meantime, we hope that uh, we are going to slow down the politics from our leaders. The referendum crusade suffered a further setback when governors from the Rift Valley defected, abandoning the push. Claiming they were representative of the whole region, the governors say the push to amend the constitution has been hijacked to serve political and partisan interests. It is a day that has shook off the support base for those clamoring to alter the constitution. The flip flop by the governor's council chairman underlying the intrigues. This as government steps up its efforts to forestall the referendum push. Samogina Ketian, Nairobi. All right, allow me now to bring my colleague Rita Tina, who's at the Nairobi National Park. Uh, Rita, you've been holding brief for us for the last two days or so. What do you have in store for us tonight? Well, James Smart, it is the story of Ahmed. And tonight we are walking down memory lane with the country's early crusade against poaching. In 1970, the then President Jomo Kenyatta ordered round-the-clock protection for a unique elephant, Ahmed. Ahmed, who had unusually long tusks, died four years later, and Jomo Kenyatta issued a decree that his remains be preserved as a symbol of the fight against poaching. Well, earlier in the day, I had the chance to see the remains of that legendary elephant, including his real tusks. Here is Ahmed's story. At the National Museums of Kenya headquarters in Nairobi stands this fiberglass model of an elephant. But this is not a cast of just any African bush elephant. This is a life-sized look-alike of Ahmed. Yes, Ahmed the legendary elephant, arguably Kenya's most famous elephant. Inside the National Museum main display hall, Ahmed's real skeleton, complete with his real tusks, is on display some 39 years after he died. Ahmed was born around the year 1919 in the Marsabit National Reserve. His tusks grew to a length where they almost touched the ground. The elephants in Marsabit were known and they were called big tuskers. Um, he was very unique in the sense that his body um, his tusks were big and his body was small. In proportion to his body, the tusks were too big. His distinct long tusks each said to weigh about 68 kilograms and him the title, the King of Mars Sabbath. And his big assets made the king a prime target for poachers during an era where poaching led to near decimation of the Kenyan elephant population. Animal lovers started a campaign to have Ahmed protected from the hands of poachers. The campaign caught the attention of Kenya's founding father, Mze Jomo Kenyatta, who declared Ahmed a national treasure in need of extra protection. 
day and night he was guarded by rangers. The then president was later to begin his own crusade to protect elephants. To date, Ahmed is the only wild animal in the country to have received such individual protection. For four years, wherever he roamed, two rangers were in tow day and night. One morning in 1974, he died. Experts say Ahmed, then estimated to be 55 years old, died of natural causes. Following his death, Jomo Kenyatta issued a decree that his remains be preserved. For future generations to learn what poaching can do and what we lose when elephants are killed. And how um, such a unique animal, if it was killed, uh, you will not see the task. You are not able to study the sizes of the task. Close to four decades later, Ahmed stands as an iconic symbol of the fight against poaching in the country. A fight that is yet to be won. The legend lives on and to help us delve further into matters conservation and poaching we are now joined by Paul Mugwa, the KWS spokesman. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the year 2013, 43 years since the country uh, kicked off that campaign against poaching in 1970. Decades later, the problem is yet to be sorted out. What is standing in the way? The, the problem is uh, the demand for ivory. The demand has kept on growing and growing in leaps and bounds. We have seen uh, changes in the, 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 the ability of the user countries, of the populations of the user countries. They have improved tremendously and their economy has improved. You find that a lot of people have moved to the middle class and they are increasingly looking for items of value to buy. And uh, unfortunately, some of the items they consider of value is ivory and uh, maybe rhino horns, and that is the source of our problem. So the demand is there, and until the demand is uh, removed or, or killed, then the problem will have to persist. Mm -hmm. Some analysts say that perhaps things are looking up. There is a new wildlife bill on the way. There is a framework that is now seeing other units such as the GSU and the administration police coming in to help in matters conservation. Looking forward, what is the outlook? Uh, we are sure that uh, wildlife will remain in spite of the challenges because uh, the problem that is facing currently facing Kenya is not facing Kenya alone. It is a problem that is being experienced across all the elephant range states. And Kenya, comparatively, is doing relatively good. However, we don't need to rest because um, those, those poachers, the moment they clear the elephants from the other range states, they will still focus on Kenya. So we need to, we need to have our acts together and ensure that uh, we put our structures in place and systems in place to ensure that we, we, we protect our wildlife. Mm -hmm. We have seen our numbers increase from an all-time high of uh, about uh, 165,000 in 1970. And then uh, by 1989, the population had really dropped to a low of 16. And right now we are talking of a population that is well above 30,000. So we are doing relatively well, but uh, we are not just about to rest will put in more efforts. But what assurance is there that generations and generations to come uh, will not be seeing remains of elephants in museums like Ahmed? Uh, the efforts we are putting in place are just about to ensure that we have our elephants population. And if anybody can take care of that and assure Kenyans that they will still in future see elephants in, uh, in the wild, not in captivity, then that uh, organization is Kenya Wildlife Service. Mm -hmm. We have the capability and the personnel and the will to do that. In the past few months, we've seen seizures of tons of ivory. Um, what's the plan? Are we going to see another burning of ivory? Are we going to create a monument? Uh, when we talk of ivory, we need first of all to ask ourselves, whose ivory is it? The ivory we have uh, is a government trophy. And that explains why every person we arrest, the people we arrest uh, with ivory or any other trophy, the charge that we prefer against them when we take them to court is being in possession of government ivory illegally. So that being the case, the ivory stockpile that we have in uh, here at KWS that we are holding 
we are doing that on behalf of Kenyans and a decision will be made at uh, an opportune time uh, at the highest level of the government to determine what will be done. Mm -hmm. However, the question of burning ivory still remains one option. However, it's not the top. Does that option does not sit at the top of the list of what needs to be done with our ivory. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, with the devolved system of government, some leaders are spoiling for a fight with KWS. In Taita Taveta, for instance, the leaders are saying that the Servo uh, National Park should be managed uh, by the Taita Taveta County Council. It's the same case with Amboseli in Kajiado County, the Maasai Mara in Aro County. Are we likely to see KWS losing control of some parks? Uh, I do not see that because uh, the constitution is extremely clear. Uh, uh, it is the fifth schedule, if I'm not wrong, uh, stipulates the roles of the central government and the roles of the county governments. And wildlife management of wildlife is, a, is an aspect that is under the central government. Of course, if that has to come, then uh, the liberation of the relevant forums of government will have to take place if that has to change. Mm -hmm. However, it is still clear that wildlife management is a function of the central government and not of county governments. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. We have been speaking to Paul Mbugwa. He is the spokesman for the Kenya Wildlife Service, of course, giving an assurance that generations to come will get a chance to see wildlife and they will not uh, see uh, remains such as we have seen with Ahmed at the Nairobi National Museum. For now, I hand things back to you, James. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Nina at the National Park holding brief for us for the last two or so days, no better way to give this, the hands of our elephant, the prominence it deserves. The BQ, in association with Nguvu Cement. All right, so President Uru Kenyatta is embarking on issuing about 60,000 title deeds to about uh, the coast residents. And on the big question tonight, I'm asking you, do you support the government's offer of those title deeds? Good evening to you. My name is Boni Tunya and I have the business. Now, Kenya has received praises from its neighbors for expediting trade and cargo flow from the port of Mombasa. This follows the commissioning of the Bath 19, the biggest upgrade to the Mombasa port since 1980. Bath 19 will allow three Panamax vessels of up to 250 meters in length to unload containers at any given time. President Kenyatta was joined by President Paul Kagame of Rwanda and Yoweri Museveni of Uganda in commissioning the Bath. Ferdinand Tomondi has that report. <laughs> President Uhuru Kenyatta was accompanied by his counterparts Paul Kagame of Rwanda and Yoweri Museveni of Uganda to commission the new container terminal in what is the single largest bath capacity expansion undertaken in 35 years. Bath number 19, which has been operational since April, is a 240-meter long facility that can handle up to three huge vessels at the same time, each measuring the size of two football pitches. The new birth 19 with 15 acres of stacking yard provides additional annual capacity of over 200,000 20-foot equivalent units and will significantly improve the port's operational efficiency. The president, however, noted that the expansion was still short of the demanded capacity of 900,000 containers. Uhuru stressed the need for improving support infrastructure to ensure the port receives, processes, and transports cargo efficiently and reiterated the government's commitment to build a standard gauge railway from Mombasa to Malaba, which will increase rail freight from the current 4% to at least 50%. It is my government's manifest intention to turn the port of Mombasa into the largest, busiest, and most business-friendly seaport on the East African coast. The visiting presidents hailed Kenya's efforts at improving efficiency at the port of Mombasa and underlined the need for regional integration towards improving business among neighbors, thus enhancing the East African community's bargaining power with the world. It's not that Kenya is doing Uganda a favor or that Uganda is doing Kenya a favor, no. It is business for mutual interest. Especially thanking the leadership for hitting the ground running, especially with the agenda of our integrated East African community. 
The Kenya Ports Authority has reported improved service delivery in the past few months, notably reducing the average days it takes to move containers from the port to Malaba to five days down from 18. Pokea pongezi zetu na tuambie hiyo barabara ndiyo tunataka kufuatilia na hata uli operator wa crane ambaye juzi alivunja rekodi ya container miatatu anione kando tuonane tuonge. Yeah. The commissioning of bath number 19 comes at a time when the port is experiencing improved levels of efficiency only a few months after a presidential directive. The two combined now sets up the port nicely for improved business from East Africa and beyond. Ferdinand Mundi, KTN, Mombasa. Equity Bank is set to be admitted as a trading participant and full member of the Nairobi Securities Exchange Limited. The banking group will be admitted under its investment arm, Equity Investment Bank. Now, this follows the acquisition of the bank of the collapsed brokerage firm Francis Thuo and Partners Limited. In a cautionary statement appearing in a section of newspapers, Equity Bank indicated it had entered into a conditional sale and purchase agreement with a beleaguered stock broker. Francis Thuo is a broker that collapsed under the weight of liquidity in 2006 and has recently fought protracted legal battles with the NSC to retain the seat it has now sold to Equity Bank. Now the bank is said to have paid 150 million shillings for the purchase. The government continues to deny its citizens an opportunity to scrutinize its spending according to the Open Budget Index. Now, the index notes that Kenya only releases select information to the public, ranking worse than its East African peers, but above Rwanda, which performed dismally. The report singled out the media review report and a year-end report, both of which are never released to the public. The two reports compare budget execution re relative to the enhanced budget and give the economic assumptions that affected budget policies. The government was also urged to include expenditures and anticipated revenues for two years beyond the budget year to give citizens a feel of the direction the government is taking. In its part, the government said it will scale up its public sector reforms to bring in the line with the constitution. Transparent system of performance indicators, the new budgeting system will reinforce accountability and promote efficiency in the public sector. Right, and finally, here's a look at the market numbers on the Financial Market Review. Good night. with Safaricom Business. Get a Lipa na Mpesa till for your business today. To sign up, SMS Lipa to 21366. Alright, it's not time for KTN Sports today. I am Nicholas Mudimba. We begin some volleyball news where winning a set at the World Volleyball Championships is the only dream the national women's team has as they prepare for the defensing of the continental title in Nairobi next month. The team is now asking for more investment on them by the government to enable them to achieve the long-term cherished dream of not, of not only dominating the sport in Africa, but extend it to the world stage. Victor Gale puts that story on perspective. National women's volleyball team has won the African title five times out of a possible six in the last ten years. And they are going for their sixth title next month, which Kenya will be the host at the Kasarani Stadium, with the World Championships ticket on their mind. <laughs> Defending the African title is not the problem the team sees. Their headache, however, is how to impress at the world stage. This team has been the bogey team during the World Cup competitions. This, according to the players, is due to lack of proper preparation after the African Championships. Hiyo title wild inaanzia kwanza na Kenya yenyewe kutupea support. Sisi kufikia hapo we need a lot of things. Actually beside kiwanja 
treatment ya players nini rasi tukitaka friendly tunaenda kucheza na team kama Rwanda ama tunacheza na Egypt na hizi ni team eh, si upiga kila wakati so au ndo wana end up ku gain na sisi tuko tu ile level same unapata most of the time si tunaanza ku train one month to game na wale u train five months to game David Lungao had won the African title three times with the national team and he feels that the National Volleyball Federation finds itself overstretched after qualifying for the event and thus needs support from the government to expose the team well before the World Championships. If we don't change our way of doing things in terms of the support that we give this team, it's going to, t to take a long time before we achieve good results at the World Cup. The African Championships will start on the 12th of September and concludes 10 days later in Nairobi. Victor Ogale, KTN Sports. Moving on now, Kenya harvested two gold medals at the East African Brookside Secondary School Games in Lira, Uganda today. Geoffrey Corrie backed the first gold medal in the boys' 10,000 meters event in the championship's new record of 29 minutes for 21.01 seconds. Rogers Mayo crossed the line in 30 minutes, 0 0.2 seconds, to back silver. Ugandan Felix Chemungas finished third to take the bronze. Uganda had their day in the girls' 5,000 meters after Ukraine World Youth Champion winner Stella Chisang won gold in 16 minutes, 40.09 seconds ahead of. Kenya's Evelyn Chilangat and Jacqueline Chipogen. Kenya won a second gold medal in the boys' triple jump in a one to finish. Gilbert Kemoe jumped 15.21 meters while Nchoi Jr. took silver after jumping 14.60 meters in 15s rugby. Defending champions Kakamega boys recorded a 16 0 victory against EP 